Thank you very much, Anthony. A greeting to all of you, dear ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor and pleasure to stand here today and uh, upon the invitation of Lumen Fide Institute and to discuss relevant and important topics of political, cultural, social, or economic nature which pertain to our common uh, Christian civilization. Thanks to the organizers that they have awarded me with probably the most difficult challenge a speaker can have to speak to an audience after lunch. So <laughs> I will try to keep you awake in the next couple of three quarters of an hour. Uh, but I did bring some important thoughts and some important messages from the other corner of uh, Europe where we tend to look at certain topics which have been addressed here this morning and in yesterday's in this whole uh, discussion and in all these panels, uh, we look at them in uh, slightly a different way than they do in liberal Western Europe. The title of my speech is quite provocative, as you can see, but I have also spoken to uh, Anthony before uh, this panel that I would like to perhaps put a little change to this title of uh, my uh, panel or my speech today, and I would amend it to Islam, the real threat to Christian culture, question mark. And the reason for that being, uh, and as you can see, it is quite provocative, I have to give an explanation why the question mark at the end, uh, I don't want to state the obvious that the appearance of an alien religion at the border of a civilization is a threat. The focus is rather on the self-destructive, suicidal nature of our own decision makers and our own political and religious elite, which is incapable of recognizing the features and the characters of its own culture and of its own civilization. <laughs> I don't want to jump ahead uh, to the conclusion, but I would like to put forward the argument which I think Cardinal Burke has also, uh, in his video message, has put forward or hinted at, is that the argument that the spread of Islam is only a negative consequence of Western nihilism. Islam only fills in the gap that we create by not standing up for our own true values of our own civilization. The loss of direction, the loss of direction is especially critical in this new era and in this new time which we have entered, this new era of globalization and of digitalization. And I think the decision makers, whether they are in politics, in academic life, or heading our churches, they still don't comprehend the, the depth of the crisis which we are facing at the beginning of this new era. I think that what digitalization and globalization is bringing around, the social change, the political change, the economic change which is coming about, it is something what we can compare to the time when humanity passed from the Stone Age to uh, the Bronze Age, or when 12,000 years before Christ in the Middle East, uh, human beings started to domesticate uh, animals, and it has revolutionized agricultural production or production in general. I would claim that this is the type of change which uh, we uh, are heading towards and what we are going to experience in our lifetimes. And I don't think that our politicians, our decision makers, our religious leaders or our academics, researchers, are grasping in any way the depth of these changes which are coming about. And this is the reason why I think it is very, very important that we talk honestly and openly about these subjects, as Cardinal Burke has also suggested. We don't even, the trouble is so great that I'm not sure we even have the vocabulary to describe 
these changes and the consequences which we are facing because the vocabulary that we have in political discourse is still from the 20th century and based on the ideological types of debates that we used to have 100 years ago or 50 years ago. We need a new terminology to describe the events which we are facing in today's times. So the problem and the trouble is great because we don't even have, we don't even speak the language which is necessary to describe the times that we are in and the times which we are facing and the consequences which we are facing. I spent my student years in this wonderful country. This is my second home. I spent between 1996 and 2004, nine years in this wonderful country, and I'm, uh, uh, I, I studied in Trinity College Dublin for four years. And one of the greatest uh, political discourses and debates which we had in Trinity College at the time in the Faculty of Political Science was what is the new world order going to be like in the post-Cold War era? And there were basically two big theories put forward, one by a man called Francis Fukuyama, who was talking about the end of history now that neoliberal theory has basically um, it, it has come out victoriously and defeated communism and socialism with neoliberal economic theory and political theory. Now that communism is gone, there is basically only one theory prevailing and it has brought about the end of history. Now basically all nations in the world are going to embrace happily the neoliberal political and economic ideology. Now even at the time there were some people who thought that this, however popular this idea might have been, it is completely naive. And there was one great theorist named Samuel Huntington who has envisaged the clash of civilizations and the new world order of multipolarism with other powers arising and instead of the bipolar world order, we are going to have the multipolar world order the rise of various powers, and these civilizations which come into existence or which rise up to form the multipolar world order are all going to be uh, based and founded on cultural characters and cultural features. The fundamentals of every civilization are cultural and religious, I may add. I think today it is a commonplace to say that in this great debate, Samuel Huntington uh, was right. Today it is evident that we live in a multipolar world with the rise of China, of Russia, of India, and even the Islam civilization as a civilization has become a separate uh, pole in this multipolar world order uh, since the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. We can say that there is such a thing as the Islam civilization and there is such a thing as an Islamic uh, pole in the multipolar world order. And definitely the United States is, it remained the leading power of the West, but there is a very, very painful question. Where is the place of Europe? Or is there a place for Europe in the multipolar world order? Huntington made one big mistake. He thought that the Western civilization is one entity. It's united, but it's not. Europe is divided as ever, and this painful question, where Europe is heading to, whether Europe can unify and at least come to some agreement on its common identity, we don't know. This discourse and this debate is going on in front of our eyes at the moment as we speak. Migration, in Hungary we say there is something uh, great in everything bad. Now the good thing about migration is that it has brought this whole political debate and this whole discourse uh, into the forefront. Now finally, this whole issue of European identity is on the surface. 
And there are some political leaders, like the Prime Minister of my country or myself, who put forward this debate very forcefully, and we say that, yes, a European identity has to be defined, and Christianity has to be at the heart and at the center of the European identity and of the European culture. <clears throat> Migration has brought about a situation whereby the split and the disagreement in Europe is extremely visible and very, very obvious. And the migration issue, everybody thinks it is some kind of uh, uh, strange surprise which just came about or came around from nowhere. It is, unfortunately, a deadly consequence of misguided policies of the past decades or of the past centuries. And what led to the migration is a deadly combination of short-sightedness, misguided policies, lack of instincts, and the lack of an immune system within the European civilization which can resist uh, mass migration. Migration is a result and the consequence of bad foreign policy. We were blind for years or for decades when we assisted the United States in pursuing its geopolitical or geostrategic uh, policies in the Middle East or in North Africa, and we were tacitly or actively contributing to a foreign policy which has entirely destroyed the neighborhood of Europe. North African countries like Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, or Middle Eastern countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria most recently, or the Ukraine in our direct neighborhood was also, is also a conflict of a geopolitical nature and Europe's instincts, Europe's immune system did not work at all when these crises propped up and when these crises basically unfolded. And now we are suffering the consequences of mass migration because we have actively participated in destroying our entire neighborhood. And Europe is defenseless, security-wise, or from the perspective of security. Responses were late, and responses were suicidal within Europe. And all the differences have come out between conservative nations or conservative countries within Europe and liberal countries uh, of the continent. Most visibly, the conflict was between the Visegrad countries, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, mainly organized by the Hungarian prime minister because he was the one who has put forward most forcefully uh, his ideas about migration and he basically announced zero tolerance for uncontrolled migration. But the Visegrad countries and Central Eastern European countries, which happen to be extremely socially conservative, uh, the difference between these countries and liberal Western European countries have become extremely visible. The difference between multicultural countries and monocultural countries have basically propped up to the surface. And we have also experienced the dictatorship of political correctness. If you stand up for your own cultural identity, you are going to be labeled a racist or you are going to be labeled uh, 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 somebody who opposes other religions or opposes uh, foreign, uh, uh, foreign uh, involvement. No, it is not. Defense of our own cultural identity is for something and not against something as Cardinal Burke has very rightly pointed it out. Europe, historically, is the most divided civilization. We can identify, or I can identify, in the past couple of centuries, uh, a couple of four big breaking points or cleavages which have uh, basically hit Europe in its most recent history. Reformation in 1517 was something which has split Europe, broadly speaking or generally speaking, into Scandinavian Europe 
and Latin Europe, with Ireland as an exception. The English Revolution in the 16th century has basically drawn a cleavage or it has drawn uh, it has brought about a breaking point between absolute monarchies and constitutional monarchies. The French Revolution, in the end of the 18th century, it has basically drawn a cleavage between hereditary monarchies and republics, multi-ethnic states, and centralized nation states. And then in the 20th century, communism and socialism, or socialist ideology and communism, has basically brought about an other cleavage into our continent or into our civilization, civic democratic societies and societies basically established on the basis of communist ideology, they have, that has brought about another major split and cleavage into our continent. But nonetheless, Europe's great achievement in human history is that it can create consensus out of very, very conflicting values. And it can bring about some kind of synthesis of all these conflicting ideas. And regardless of the fact that those values which we can refer to as European values are pillars of the European cultures, we have to add that they have come about as a result of great conflicts in European history. These pillars of the European culture are the Greek-Roman humanism, enlightened rationalism, the ethos of freedom, and most importantly, Christianity and Christian ethics. Christianity is at the center of our culture and of our civilization. I can say that Europe's history is the history of Christianity, and Res Publica Christiana is what characterizes our civilization the most. And as Arnold Toynbee, the great English historian, has put it, the fundamentals of every civilization are religious. And I couldn't agree with him more. T.S. Eliot, a great poet, in 1945, when he was sending a radio message to the Germans after the Second World War, he has put forward in my mind, the, in the nicest way, what Christianity and what Christian Europe is about, and I would have to quote him. It is Christianity that our arts have developed. It is in Christianity that the laws of Europe, until recently, have been rooted. It is against a background of Christianity that all of our thought has significance. An individual European may not believe that the Christian faith is true, and yet what he says and makes and does will all spring out of this heritage of Christian culture and depend upon that culture for its meaning. I do not believe, says T.S. Eliot, that culture of Europe could survive the complete disappearance of the Christian faith. If Christianity goes, the whole culture goes. That's the end of the quote. And I also agree with Fernand Brodel, the great French historian and philosopher, who said that Christianity is such an important component of European identity that it is even the most important cornerstone of their identity of those who are religiously indifferent or even atheists. So even the atheists or religiously indifferent people of the European civilization, Christianity is the focal point. This is what Brodel says, and I, I think he's quite right in having said so. But the sad thing is that Christianity is not recognized by the liberals of today's world. Atheists look at it as the focal point, but liberals don't. They don't accept the Christian values of our civilization. It is for the liberals and for the political generation of 1968, which is running our continent and running the political scene in the European Union, in the European civilization today, that our Christian roots 
are basically denied and the inclusion of Christian values in the European debates are completely sabotaged. It is up to this political elite. Elements and components of collective identity are language, culture, historical conscience, religion, and also the identification of our common enemies and opponents. These are the elements and the components of a collective identity. In Europe, in the European Union, the leaders have continuously, in the past 40, 50 years, they have denied and sabotaged. They have conducted a sabotage against including Christian values in the fundamental documents of what is known as the European Union. In 1973, the Copenhagen De Declaration, it basically doesn't even take into consideration uh, collective identity or European identity. Christianity is not even mentioned. It is basically some kind of reference to common foreign policy goals, but common identity is not part of that document. And it was not included in the Maastricht Treaty, it was not included in the Lisbon Treaty, Instead, there is a reference to cultural diversity in Europe, but there is no mention of a common European identity. And when the constitutional process was running in Europe between 2002 and 2004, there were huge debates about whether Christianity should be included or not. There were some people who said, well, it's quite obvious that Christianity is part of the Christian heritage and part of the Christian civilization or part of the European civilization. That's the fundamentals. But it was not included in the Constitution. It was taken out because the majority in the political elite in the European Union opposes the Christian values or the inclusion of Christian values in these fundamental uh, documents. Now, who are we and who are we not? These are the questions that have to be posed when you are looking for the answer to what European identity is. And I'm afraid that it is not only the leaders of the European Union or the leaders of our continent who don't know the answer to these questions or who don't want to bother giving an answer to these questions but also some of the conservative circles in our continent, even some of those who we say are radicals and they are fighting off migration in a very uh, firm manner, when you ask them, they, you might agree with them on migration or on the Islam, but when it comes to the Christian values, then you would have trouble finding the consensus or finding the common ground. Julius Evola, the great philosopher said that every theory has to stand the so-called air test. If you can only put forward a theory in opposition to something, it is not good enough. If you can only say who you are not, it is not enough. You have to be able to state and define who you are and what are the values that you stand for. And most people can say who they are not and what they oppose, but they cannot say a complex sentence about what values they represent and what they stand for. And this is the problem of most conservative politicians on the European continent. They might be able to say that the Islam is a danger or that migration is a problem but they wouldn't be able to say what values they stand for. Or they wouldn't say or state that they represent Christian values. And those are the values which their policies are based on. And this is the real problem, not the Islam threat. My country, Hungary, in the 16th and 17th century, it was under Ottoman invasion. The Turkish Empire, at the time called Ottoman Empire, invaded my country. They were there for 170 years in Hungary. Nonetheless, there was not a single Hungarian who converted to the Islam because their faith 
was strong and their attachment to their Christian faith was strong. So they survived the almost 200 years of Ottoman occupation in Hungary. Now the trouble is that if you don't have a strong faith, there is nothing to resist the appearance of a foreign religion or a foreign culture. It is only the firmness in our belief which can basically repel outside pressure. And it is good to know that we have to fight against migration, that we have to fight against immigration, and it is important to say that the Islam is not our religion, but if we want to survive, we have to be firm in our Christian beliefs because that is what provides us with the greatest protection in our civilization today. I'm afraid that some of those movements which have propped up in response to migration in the United States, the alt-right movements, which I can see are not something which I, when, when I speak of conservatism, it is not alt-right which comes to my mind in the first instance, if you know what I mean, and I think that's an understatement. I'm afraid that some Western European parties which are staunchly opposing migration and have uh, policies which are directed against the Islam, they are defending the values of liberal Europe and defending nihilism of the European continent and not standing out for the Christian values. What we see in Europe today, there are some efforts to build a common European identity. We have a European flag, we have a common currency, we have some tax directives, we are harmonizing law on our continent, but as far as European identity is concerned, we cannot find the fundamentals and we cannot find the features which all Europeans agree on. When we look at symbols of Europe, we can just find some kind of horrific characters. In 2014, there was a Eurovision Song Contest. Eurovision Song Contest was established in order to have, to strengthen common European identity. That was the whole idea behind it. But when Conchita Wurst, the bearded woman of Austria, another conservative country on our continent, won the Eurovision Song Contest, I think most Europeans or some conservative Europeans were in utter shock. And it is not only enough that Conchita Wurst has won the European Song Contest and that she called herself the Queen of Europe, but the president of Austria, named Heinz Fischer, and the archbishop, the cardinal of Vienna, who almost became a pope last time round, Christoph Schönborn, they have basically congratulated Conchita Wurst and said that they are extremely proud of Conchita Wurst's achievements because this is the symbol of real European strength and real European identity. Now, I think this is the real tragedy when we have such uh, phenomena on our continent and when we see that religious leaders see, say that tolerance is important and tolerance should be exercised in such a case and we should celebrate diversity when it comes to Conchita Wurst or the European Song Contest. I think this is a disaster. I think leaders of our religious institutions should also do some soul searching. And they should also sit down and think about how to strengthen and how to put forward the Christian values on our continent. I would be happy if our political elite would do it. But it is first and foremost our religious leaders who should identify the Christian values and act upon them 
when it comes to decision making. So I would come to the conclusion of my little contribution I would come to concluding my uh, little contribution by what should be done and what can be done in such a uh, situation of extremely deep crisis, which is a crisis of economic, political nature, but first and foremost of a cultural nature. How can we overcome this situation which we are facing in Europe today, and how can we survive because I'm afraid that if we don't find, uh, on the fast track, we don't find our values which we can hold on to, Europe will basically collapse, like T.S. Eliot has basically envisaged. Because without Christianity, our civilization and our culture does not stand a chance. What can be done? Now, the migration crisis and the Brexit process has brought about some quite fruitful debates on the European continent and in the European institutions about what the European identity is and how, what direction Europe should be heading into. And there's this eternal debate about fe between federalists and those who uh, propose that as the EU should be a close cooperation of nation states. Now, I think this is a somewhat fruitless debate. Federalism is not possible without a common European identity. And unfortunately, in the globalized world of today, there is no such thing as self-sufficiency on the nation state level. Hungary might be a monocultural country, which is, as opposed to a multicultural country, but with the open borders, with the Hungarian youth going out, flowing out to Western Europe to study, to work, with uh, EU funds flowing into our country, with foreign investment flowing into our country, we are very, very far away from being self-sufficient. We like to think of ourselves as an independent, sovereign nation state, but I think it is just as utopistic as the illusion of complete federal uh, Europe. What can be done in the European Union? What, what is the system that could work and function within the European Union? I think that to such a diverse continent, a confederation is the only system which is suitable. Confederation, on the Swiss example, is something where decisions are split between the local level and the higher levels we identify those areas which are better off at the nation level or at the, at the local level, and we identify those areas on which we have to cooperate. Global issues, global challenges, which we are facing all together. But we can only do that, and we can only uh, protect ourselves against the spread of Islam if we find the common identity and the Christian identity, which is the fundamentals of uh, Europe and of our European civilization. The greatest achievement of Europe is that it could always create a consensus among conflicting ideas and conflicting values. We have, we live in times of extreme crisis. We live in a time when conflicts in our continent are enormous. But I do hope that in this continent, out of this debate which we are facing now on the European continent, we can come up with a consensus. We can come up with a solution whereby all European nations can basically participate uh, together in building a common Europe. But it is only possible and it is only feasible if the common European identity based on Christian values is identified and it is looked for. What might happen next year? And I truly hope that it will happen because I think that's the only chance that we stand. If the European elite, the liberal European elite 
disappears after European parliamentary elections, and those people step into their place, which recognize the importance of a common European identity and the relevance and the importance of Christian values in the European civilization. I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you... Thank you very much.